Hello and welcome to uh, DV Club India, September 2018. Um, my name is Mike Bartley, I'm the CEO and founder of Test and Verification Solutions. I'm just going to give a very short talk on the main verification challenges uh, in safety compliance. Um, just as a bit of background, a number of companies are contemplating moving into safety. Uh, the big market at the moment is automotive, it's the fastest growing semiconductor market at the moment. Um, but there are significant barriers to entry, and one of those is ISO 26262 compliance. Um, ISO 26262 is the safety standard um, that covers um, chips and software that go into the automotive market. But there are other safety markets as well, which are growing relatively fast, such as drones and robotics, uh, which also have safety standards. Um, in other space, for example, we have DO254 and DO178. Uh, DO254 is hardware, 178 is the software. Uh, in medical, um, we have IX62304. Um, but most industries where there's a um, possibility to do harm to people, um, there is a safety standard covering both the chip and software development for, for products in that market. I'm going to cover two main safety challenges. When, when we do a lot of work with our customers in the safety domain, these two challenges come up time and time again, and the most two difficult challenges um, to overcome if you want to work in safety verification. And that's requirements tracing and fault analysis. Requirements tracing is the ability to, to clearly define requirements and trace them all the way through to implementation and verification. Fault analysis is the identification of potential faults within the, the chip and how we detect those faults and recover from those faults. And I'll go into those two into more detail now. First, sorry, first of all, requirements management. ISO 26262, which remember covers safety and automotive, is very clear. The management of safety requirements includes managing requirements, obtaining agreement on the, on the requirements, obtaining commitments from those implementing the requirements, and maintaining traceability. So the diagram below is, is a pictorial representation of that statement. We start at the top with stakeholder requirements, both internal and external customers. And we have to have those very clearly defined. From them, we derive product requirements. And you can see the lines going from stakeholder to product requirements. This is because we need to be able to trace how a stakeholder requirement is implemented via a product requirement. From there, we add safety requirements. There are specific requirements for safety. For example, detection that we can, um, detection of lane changing if we're doing driver assistance in automotive, um, that the, the car can detect a lane change and, and, oh, and warn the driver. That may be a safety requirement. So we add in safety requirements, and then from, from the product and safety requirements, we can derive our system and module specs. This is how we're going to, this is a specification of how we're going to implement those requirements. And from there, we can write designs and RTL and software that implements those. And then we have our verification plans, which turn into test and verification results. And there, our proof of implementation. And throughout this hierarchy, we have a traceability, both going down, so I can take trace of requirement, to a piece of code or a cover point and how that cover point's been hit. And I can go upstream from a cover point or line of code to see which requirement that line of code or cover point is implemented. So it's bi-directional, full traceability from requirements all the way to proof of implementation. Here's another pictorial representation of that. This time, rather than going top down, we're going left to right, breaking requirements down into smaller requirements, refining those requirements, and eventually setting measurable goals in terms of verification. And our intent, um, and from those measurable goals, we can derive verification results, which give us our proof of implementation. So that's the first one, refining requirements and requirements traceability. Again, People find that very difficult. Not many people are used to having a full set of requirements and then tracing those all the way through to lines of code and proof of implementation. 
The second challenge is fault analysis. And, and before we start this, we'll look at how systems fail. What can go wrong with a system? And there's three, the, uh, the standards identify three potential ways systems can fail. First one is random failures. This is where uh, it, usually a, a electrical disturbance on the chip. Um, it may be, for example, the, the part wearing out over time, uh, a, a, a particular gate gets stuck at, or an external influence such as an alpha particle hits the chip um, and flips a bit to one from one to zero, or vice versa. These are what we call random failures. And we know how to predict the number of random failures because we can base it on statistics. We know how many alpha particles are likely to hit a chip. We know how long it takes for a part to wear out and start to develop stuck at fault. So based on statistics, we can predict the number of random failures. What we have to be able to do in our chips is be able to detect those random failures and either recover from them or fail gracefully. Systematic faults are faults in our development process. Systematic failures. So during our development process, we may introduce bugs in the system spec, in the requirements, in the code, in the way we verify the code. And in order to overcome these systematic failures, we have to follow a well-managed development process. And through that process, we're asked to deliver a number of development artifacts, for example, specifications, requirements, documents, specification documents, code reviews, test plans, proof of verification of those test plans. And if you look at each standard, there'll be a huge array of development artifacts which must be produced, and you must be able to demonstrate you follow the well-defined development process and that the, very, the various development artifacts have been correctly delivered. For example, one of those may be you need 100% line coverage of your RTL or your software, and you have to then deliver, have a development artifact which demonstrates that you've hit that particular line coverage target. Systemic failures are failures in the, in the culture or practices of the organization. And normally, for example, there may be a, a poor quality management cultural process and that's normally detected by external reviews like we do with quality audits um, or we can have an external auditor come in and look at our, our, our culture and practices and try to remedy those. The well, first thing we have to do is perform a risk analysis to determine our tolerance to failure. In other words, what is our product, what is our chip or software going to be used for, and how much failure can we tolerate within that use model? So let's look at this. This table tries to summarize this. In the risk analysis, and this is ISO 26262, so this is an automotive risk analysis. First of all, we look at the severity of injuries. In other words, what's the impact of a failure? What damage can be caused through a failure? E is the frequency of exposure to hazard. Okay, so how often does the fault occur and how long does it usually occur for? And C is controllability. How much control can we have over that hazardous event? For example, if a driver of the car can take back control, how quickly can they do that? And is, can we overcome the hazard by taking over control? From there, we have S1, S2, S3. S3 is the highest severity. E1, E2, E4. E4 is the highest frequency. And C1, C2, C3, where C3 is the lowest controllability. In other words, we have very little control over that hazard. So for example, if the, brake, the, the, the chip decides to apply the brakes and there's no override by the driver, then that's a very low controllability and it will be a C3. And then from there, we can determine various 
safety integrity levels, which we call ACL, so automotive safety integrity level. ACL A is the lowest, ACL D is the highest. QM stands for quality management. So as you can see there, we're ranging from quality management at the lowest severity, lowest frequency, highest controllability. From the top left down to the bottom right, which is ACL D, where we've got the highest severity, highest frequency, and lowest controllability. That sets a very high bar and will tell us, first of all, how much verification we need to do. The whole development process is affected if it's ACLD. It's a much more rigorous development process. Regarding verification, we have to have very high coverage targets. We have to demonstrate how well we develop that verification plan of really vig rigorous and methodology to develop the verification plan. And we also have to have very high levels of uh, random fault detection. For example, it, it would be something like 99.999% of all faults must be detectable. So any of those random faults that can occur on our chip, we must be able to detect 99.999% of them in ACLD. So in order to be able to detect those faults, we, we have to design into the chip protection from faults. As I mentioned before, permanent faults such as stack out, transient faults such as an external alpha particle. And as I said before, we must be able to detect a certain percentage, and the exact percentage depends on the ACL level. For ACL D, it will be a higher percentage. For ACL A, it will be a lower percentage. And the types of techniques that we put into our chips in order to do this detection is ECC, as error correction control, a lot of these, a lot of chips now have error co correction control. It's able to detect single bit faults and correct single bit faults for multi bit faults. It, has, it just detects them. And then uh, typically the hardware will raise an interrupt and the software will decide how to do the, deal with that. Uh, Lockstep designs is another way. So, for example, you, you have two CPUs running in parallel and they check their results against each other. If there's a fault, it's likely that one of the CPUs uh, will give a different result to the other CPU. And then at that point, you've detected the fault by that um, miscompare on the CPU results. Software runs regular DFT patterns. So what we, we build into the chip is a set of DFT patterns that can run during operation and typically a number of times per second, those DFT patterns will be run and some software will check uh, the result from DFT patterns and therefore it can detect stuck at faults, for example, or maybe also transient faults. Then we have to be able to demonstrate through fault simulation that our detection mechanism can find that high level percentage of faults. So, through fault simulations, we inject faults into the design, and then we run our verification regression suite. Um, and if it hits the fault, then do we detect the fault? So basically, as those regression suites run, do they hit the particular fault, for example, a stuck at fault? If the regression suite hits that fault, then does the design detect it? And the objective is to measure the percentage of faults detected to see if we meet the target, which is determined by our ACL level. We can also use this to verify the lockstep and also verify the software can load and run DFT configurations. And you'll be seeing during today's DV Club, uh, there's a particular flow for this from Cadence uh, using the uh, V Manager flow. <coughs> with a, a, a functional safety simulator to, um, as well. And that will inject the faults and then see if we can detect those faults. So I hope you enjoyed today's DV Club. Um, it's been brought to you in partnership between Cadence and Test and Verification Solutions. Obviously, Cadence provides the tools you need to demonstrate your safety compliance. 
and TVS provides the expertise and services that you need for that as well. Thank you very much for listening.